Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Alhamdulillah Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiru wa natubu ilayhi wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa sayyati a'malina min yahdi Allah fa huwa min yahdi Allah fala mudilla lah wa min yudlil fala hadiya lah وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم أما بعد هبت في الله I chose this book because of its importance and conciseness in dealing with such a meaningful topic this book warns the believer about those major sins that can take one outside of the fold of Islam and make them and make them a disbeliever in the book of Allah or the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in accordance with the principles derived from the book of Allah and the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wa ala alihi wasallam and the consensus of the scholars and as we get into the treaties, you'll understand more of what I'm talking about because Ahlul Sunnah only makes takfir and uses this principle of takfir of declaring a Muslim to be a non-Muslim in accordance with certain principles. And then we will discuss these principles in the future. And it has to be in accordance with what? With the Quran. And it has to be in accordance with what? The sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And it has to be something which is held by consensus or is a general precedent by the Muslim scholars. The way in which we'll study this text will be primarily through a compilation of explanations of the book Nullifiers of Islam or Nawaqid al-Islam is the name of the book in Arabic, Nawaqid al-Islam, or Nullifiers of Islam. And this is a book by Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, rahimahullah ta'ala. Another issue I want to raise regarding our methodology for studying this book is that I hope with patient perse uh, perseverance from you as listeners to offer everyone something during this study. Sometimes you find that the scholars of Ahl Sunnah when teaching books, sometimes they teach it only for students of knowledge. Or sometimes they teach it for the general worshippers in the masjid. Or perhaps for beginning students or even advanced students. So what we will try to do in this study is I will try my best, inshallah ta'ala, to give benefit for all the participants. So please be patient. In the beginning of the treaties, it will be some somewhat difficult principles because this subject matter is of incredible importance and it is deep and has great depth and great controversy and so we must lay a foundation about Tawheed and about uh, shirk and, and disbelief and about the issue of takfir because all of these principles this whole book is about those sins or some sins which take a person out of the fold of Islam because Ahlul Sunnah their belief is what is that the major sins do not make a person a disbeliever however there are certain sins that are major which do take a person out of the fold of Islam and that's what this treatise uh, will discuss some of those sins before we begin we will briefly give a background about Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab so as to understand the context this text was written in because without proper context people can misunderstand and or improperly apply the nullifiers of Islam to other individuals and attempt to make takfir of their brothers and sisters in Islam like the original Khawarij sect 
and some of the contemporary groups or jama'at. And some of these contemporary groups and jama'at that are well known, like Al-Qaeda in this time, also Boko Haram in Nigeria, uh, Al-Shabaab in Somalia, and one of the most brutal and extreme takfiri groups that, by the permission of Allah, are being wiped out as far as their large numbers, but we know that their terror will continue, is ISIS or ISIL or Daesh. So all of these groups abuse the principles of takfir. And in fact, you'll find that they refer to this very text and other texts by Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab. That's why it's important for us to have some background and some context of his treaties to understand what's the difference between the beliefs of Ahl Sunnah and the beliefs of Ahl Bid'ah, like these people of the Takfiriyin. Uh, some of some important terms that we need to look at, uh, terms like what we mean by jihad. Jihad, one of the uh, jihad in the Quran refers in general to fighting, to fighting in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to make Islam a victorious. Also jihad, uh, there's jihad in ilm, in knowledge, there's jihad in nafs, striving to fight one's sins and one's own desires. And then there's another term that we need to be uh, have an understanding, although we're not going to get into all these uh, terms, but just in case they come up, when we refer to the term jihadi. Jihadi means those people who fight and claim it is in the name of Islam, claim it is fi sabilillah, when in fact they are usually a jihadi takfiri group which is fighting for some uh, political cause or nationalism or something else instead of <coughs> according to Islamic uh, principles. Other terms, where does the term takfir come from? Takfir is derived from the term kafara, yakfuru, kafir, kuffar, takfir, kafara. Kafara meaning uh, if we translate this term kafara, the, the verb, it's a verb in the past, uh, the simple past in, in English. It is fi'l madi in, uh, in Arabic and it refers to uh, disbelief. It is a verb though. He disbelieved, for example. Yakfuru means he disbelieves. It's an active, uh, it is a simple present or the present, uh, present uh, tense. Kafir is also derived from the same verb. Kafir meaning one who does an action of disbelief or one who disbelieves. Kufar is the plural of kafir. Takfir. Now you understand the term takfir comes from this. It's derived from these uh, from this verb and these uh, nouns or ism fa'il. So takfir refers to the belief. Uh, this is one meaning of takfir. We don't need this. is not an Arabic lesson. But for the purpose of our lessons, takfir means it refers to uh, declaring someone else to be a disbeliever, which is an incredibly dangerous uh, and serious matter, as the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, and as we'll get into as we get into our lesson. And the last a verb that we refer to, kafara. So kafara means to is it's when the the subject is declaring someone else to be a disbeliever so you say kafara shaks or kafara uh kafara al-albani uh qadhafi that means imam al-albani made takfir of qadhafi this is an example and actually maybe not a good example because i don't know if the imam did, but we know uh, Bin Baz and some of the other ulama of Ahl Sunnah, Sheikh Muqbil did, so we could have used those examples. But the point is, is I just wanted to give you an idea of the term takfir, where it comes from. Moving on to something very brief about the seerah of Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab rahimahullah ta'ala and some of the controversy. So probably one of the most controversial and misunderstood figures regarding the issue of takfir in contemporary times is Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, and he 
uh, is a part of, uh, you know, for the present day Saudi Arabia, and his books are taught in the schools and it's taught in the curriculum here, that uh, he, it was him and uh, the King Saud who came together and formed an alliance, and this is kind of the beginnings of the contemporary Saudi state or one of the stages of the development of Saudi Arabia as we know it today. Uh, due to his strong rel religious convictions and heading the revival movement in the Arab Peninsula, he is strongly associated by his detractors, meaning those who go against him, uh, both Muslim and non-Muslim alike, as a central figure in the Neo-Tekfiri movement. So many people declare, and this is why you always hear people say, Wahhabi, so-and-so is Wahhabi, oh you are Wahhabi. They are using a term, they're using the term in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Wahhab. You know, he is the, the giver. But they are using the term, they have derived from the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his sifa, or his one of his sifat, his divine characteristics, they're using it in a negative, in a negative way to say so-and-so is a Wahhabi. But Ahlul Sunnah says there's no such thing really as a Wahhabi. But there are those people who hold Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab to be a scholar and to be a reviver of the creed, of especially of reviving Tawheed in the Arab Peninsula and the, its effects around the world. Uh, and there's so much to say uh, about Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, but we'll move on to give you just a little bit, uh, a little bit more background. According to those supportive of the ideas espoused by Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab during his lifetime, most of the Muslim world, and especially the Arab Peninsula, had become saturated with idol and grave worship. And it had become common practice to go to the graves of saints, to pray to them, and seek their intercession. And this was, even, uh, this was under the Ottoman Empire. The last final Khalifat had a lot of these uh, types of practices widespread. Uh, also, pilgrimage, meaning the Hajj, was performed to the graves of people who called to the worship of themselves during their lifetimes, and these acts were believed to bring people closer to Allah. And this is what the original uh, pagan, pagan Arabs of the time of the Prophet Wasallam. this is what they used to say. They say we only worship them, meaning their, their idols and statues, to bring us closer to Allah. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran. Uh, Ibn Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah ta'ala compared them with the original disbelievers at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who supplicated with Allah those who were favored by him either the prophets or the angels or the, the trees or stones who, uh, which are obedient to Allah. So this differs from the sinners of our time who associate the vilest of people with Allah. So the pagans of the time of the Prophet والسلام, and even uh, perhaps uh, the pagans of the time of the Prophet والسلام, they associated partners with Allah so they committed shirk similar to the way the Christians do with saying we pray certain Christians that believe that Jesus is not God, but yet that they pray to him for intercession. This is similar to the way those pagans who said La ilaha illallah, or the, the people of the time of Muhammad ibn the Wahhab and even before him that had crept into the Ummah with the shirk, that they began to worship the graves and say that they would intercede on their behalf and bring them closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is very important for us to understand some of this history, to get this context why? Because this helps us to get a background of this book, of the time this book was written, why, why it was written, and we'll, we'll have uh, further discussion of that once we get into the text itself. So as we mentioned, there are many critics of Muhammad ibn al Wahhab, but that's a little bit about that imam's life, is that he fought jihad fi sabilillah, and he made clear to the people, he did not as, for example, ISIL, because they often compare themselves in their writings to the movement of Muhammad ibn al Wahhab. What is a big difference that even non Muslim academics notice about this difference? Is that Muhammad ibn al Wahhab, Balagha Hujjah, that he, 
he uh, gave the evidence to those people, gave them Dawa. And what is the Dawa? He wrote these books like uh, uh, Asul al-Thalatha, The Three Principles. This was actually a letter, like a letter, a letter form. And that's why you have different versions, if you will, because it was, the books then were copied by hands. There was no printing press. So there's different versions, and they were sent to different people as a form of Dawa. And that's why you see that he's always giving uh, Dua in the book, saying, uh, for example, I'lam rahimakallah. You know, he's saying, and no, and may Allah have mercy upon you. And then he'll give you principles, and he was giving Dawa to those people. Giving them Dawa to what? Calling them back to the book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and away from shirk and bid'ah and kufr. And so he established the proof and gave Dawa before it went to the affair of fighting. And this is the difference with those contemporary takfiri groups like Daesh, Boko Haram. There's no Dawa with these people. Shabab. They just say you believe our way and then they attack and they kill Muslims. And they uh, put suicide bombings and women as suicide bombers and explosions and killing and all the slaughter that we see that's done in the name of Islam, which is in fact a crime against humanity and a crime against Islam and a crime against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his religion. And we will stop there for now. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.